and starting us off is going to be the future of virtual reality. Um, Joey, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Ami. Let me share my screen real fast. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Joey Darbyshire, and today I want to discuss with you uh, problems and things that reflect fun when you're developing in virtual reality versus other um, normal web applications. So first thing we're going to be talking about will be unique problems to virtual reality itself, as well as um, concepts to consider in virtual reality that you wouldn't normally think about when you're developing web applications, solutions to both of those issues, as well as anything I'd possibly go on a tangent about while we're discussing this. So I have a lot to discuss and not a lot of time to talk about, so I'm going to jump right into it. The first thing I want to talk about is the distinct lack of peripherals, or as I like to put it, where are my buttons? Um, if you don't know who this is, it's a comedian by the name of Brent Morin. He's got a Netflix special. I think he's hilarious. It's one of my favorite jokes from him. Uh, go watch him if you haven't seen it. So what do I mean by where are my buttons? So let's look at like modern uh, VR headsets. So we have the Daydream, right? And the Daydream controller has five buttons on it total. Two of those are specifically for volume, whereas the other three are probably the only three you'll be able to use for your application. You have things like the HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift, which have about 15 to 18 buttons and a joystick. Uh, the PlayStation VR uses the PS4 controller or the PS Move controller, which has about 18 to 2 buttons. Um, that's a bit, but that's not a lot when you think about things like even just your TV remote, which just controls your TV, has like 50 plus buttons on it sometimes, or like a keyboard and mouse has about 900 million buttons on it. Um, in any given situation. To, uh, to put this in perspective, this is a game I play pretty regularly called Final Fantasy XIV. Um, every one of these squares down here at the bottom uh, and on here on the right represents an action or an ability that I can do in the game. And each one of them has its own unique button combination to it. So my mouse has about 17 buttons on it. I have three keyboard modifiers for it. I have WASDA. I have various other keyboard inputs for menu controls, all that. Altogether, I have about 80 different button combinations just to play one game. So how am I possibly supposed to interact with a virtual reality game that only has three buttons like a Daydream controller does? So one of the first solutions you could really think about doing is displaying an on-screen key, on keyboard. And this is something that consoles have done for a really long time. Um, they'll just display the keyboard. You select the letters and type it out. It's very slow, but it's very effective. Things like searching or just inputting short commands or whatever. Um, but it's not ideal if you wanted to write a program like Slack in virtual reality. How am I supposed to type out long messages to my teammates if I have to select each letter individually? That could take forever. So another way to go about it would be triggers, right? Uh, the game I mentioned earlier, Final Fantasy XIV, has a version on the PlayStation 4, which I said has about 18 buttons on the controller. So the way they do it is they have four buttons on the controller, which are dictated as triggers. And whenever you're pressing any of those triggers, it changes what the other buttons of the controller does. It allows you to get a wider variety of button combinations in order to get, gain different controls over your application. Um, that's great and all, but you have to remember virtual reality adds something new. It adds motion to the mix. So you can start using things like your arm raising, your head moving from side to side. All these things um, add to a new gesture system that will allow you to interact with your application that we haven't seen before in a web, our web development. Um, if you look over here, you see what is, would be the two-dimensional gesture system that most people already use on their smartphones, right? So imagine taking that to the third dimension. You could start doing more like arm reaching and stuff like that. You could implement things like sign language or something like A, B, C, like just simple like that would really make it easier to type in a virtual reality environment that we just couldn't do in um, web applications normally. So that being said, I'm going to move on to the next thing, which is um, when you're developing VR, you need to stop thinking in Windows and start thinking in rooms. So Windows are this big convention we've had for the past 20 or 30 years where everything has its own box, everything stacks on top of itself. It works very nicely for computers, for smartphones, for everything that we use in our daily lives now because they all exist on two-dimensional surfaces. In virtual reality, you have a third dimension, and users, without even knowing it, are going to expect you use that third dimension. They're going to require you to reach out and make that third dimension useful to them or else there's no reason for them to even be in your VR application because if they can just view it on their computer, why would they view it in VR? So I'm going to give you two examples of applications that I think one does it well and one does it poorly. Uh, so the first one here is the YouTube app for the Daydream. If you've never seen this application, the way it works is you're in a large black domed room. Um, floating in front of you is a floating screen or a window 
where you access your searches, where you access your controls for your video. If you're watching a 2D video, it's just displayed there as a floating window. If you look around here on the sides over here, while you're looking at this, this is all just empty space. There's nothing there. Um, if you're watching a 360 degree video, though, it's very immersive because it fills up the whole dome, right? The whole dome just surrounds you 360 video, and that's, that's really nice. But on the other hand, you have things like the Netflix app, where whenever you're going to view it, you're sitting in this cabin that's on the mountainside. Over here, there's like a large window where you can see out into the mountains. You've got posters on the wall that display like current shows that are popular on Netflix. There's furnishings around. Um, this TV is quite a bit larger in the actual application, about this big. Um, when you go to select a movie, the lights dim down. It feels very much like you're sitting in your own living room watching your own TV. It's a very immersive environment. But all that being said, 2D video is probably the worst example I could give for a VR application. 2D video just doesn't work in virtual reality because of the idea that it is, in fact, two-dimensional. And we're trying to build in a third dimension here. So really trying to think more outside the box when you're developing applications. How can I extend my application to the third dimension? How could I make something that's more useful in three dimensions, like a 3D modeling program where you start out with a block and you chip away at the block to shape out a stool or something where then you could export that stool as a 3D model and use it in other programs. Like These are more ideal for what a 3D environment would use. So let me move on to my next point, which is immersion. So what is immersion? Um, immersion is this concept that's been really popular in games for a really long time, but it's something that's really going to start taking off more in application development when VR comes in. Um, immersion is the idea that the user feels involved with your application. They feel engaged in the story. They feel like it's a part, like they're a part of it, as opposed to um, feeling disconnected or understanding that this is just a computer screen or whatever. Um, so one example I think of really good immersion is um, Fallout, the Fallout universe, and the Pit Boy. And if you've never played Fallout, it's this game series that's based in a post-nuclear war, war land. Um, it kind of takes these old concepts of like ideas from the 20s and 30s and gives them new technological looks, very steampunky kind of ideas. And if you've ever played Fallout, you're very familiar with the Pit Boy. The Pit Boy is this large bracelet that the main character of the series will wear on their wrist. And every time they want to check their stats, check their items, change the settings in their menu, the main character will lift up their arm and look at their arm look at this pit boy in order to do all that. And it feels very a part of the world. It feels like it's very um, built into the environment. It doesn't feel like, oh, I just opened a menu and now I've just broken my immersion from the game. I'm still, I still feel like I'm engaged as the character of Fallout. And I think that's a great example of how you could use immersion in a VR experience as well. So what creates immersion for a user? So the main things are your five senses, right? And the two big ones that you're going to see in VR are going to be sight and sound. Um, sight is obviously huge. It's the whole reason we even have headsets so you can see the world around you. But sound is also going to play a large part in that going forward. So what's the two big ways that we currently use sound, right? So currently we see stereo sound, which is a left and a right channel. And then every time you play a sound, it plays at varying level volumes of left and right in order to give the user the feeling like the sound is around them as opposed to just playing from the speakers. And you also have what's called surround sound, which is either four or five speakers and a subwoofer, and it gives you a more directional sound feeling. Uh, so my headset is actually Dolby 5.1. It is surround sound. So if I hear a sound coming from back there in my game, it actually sounds like it's coming from back there. It's more immersive, and it's definitely uh, better, but it's still you can still just tell it's synthetic sound. It's not perfect, right? So when it comes to VR, um, this concept that's been around for a long time called binaural audio is really starting to take off because of how immersive it can actually be. You've never heard of binaural audio. It's recorded with this funny looking mic that looks like an ear for the reasoning that the ear is already really good at shaping sound in a way that the brain can understand distance and direction. So why don't we record sound in the same way? That way they only need a left and a right channel. You could play those left and right channels straight into the ear and it just sounds like your ear has picked it up from around you and it sounds very immersive at the uh, at the end of my demo i'll have links to several videos that this uh show by our play binaural audio so you can listen to it and let me tell you it really does sound like it's right there um it's insane actually the difference uh moving on so the other big thing you have to be aware of when you're developing as far as immersion is spatial awareness um this is a situation where your user is actually too immersed into your 
application and they forget that they still exist in the real world. This is a situation where the user accidentally punches their monitor or bashes their leg against the coffee table because they forget that, oh, I'm not in this VR world. I'm still here. I'm still a real person. So you have to be really careful when you're developing your gestures or developing your actions that the user doesn't go and hurt themselves or break things because they'll be upset with not only themselves, but with you as a designer for making those choices. So really be careful. But at the end of the day, you have to remember that I'm not an expert, but nor is anyone else in this topic. VR is still in its baby sta stages. These are the points where conventions are going to start being established. We're going to start setting trends that are going to be norms for the next 20, 30, 50 years in VR. And feel free to experiment with it. Uh, remember that there are still problems with VR. Uh, people still find it to be very tech dummy, tech demo -y, very gimmicky. So remember that function is still king over over form. So don't include things just for the sake of including them. Make sure you have a reason for including everything in your application and make sure it all flows nicely. I'll leave you with this quote that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, this is the reality that virtual reality is this new universe that you get to create. You get to set all the rules for it. You get to set what it looks like, how the user interacts with it, everything. So have some fun with it. Be creative with it. It's very, very powerful what we can do with virtual reality if we do it right. Uh, here's some links to cool things I found while I was making this, as well as my capstone project, which was a VR project that I did. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot, Joey. Um, yeah, anybody listening out there, if um, if you ever want to nerd out about virtual reality, Joey is absolutely the person to reach out to. <laughs> um, um, he has a lot of um, amazing ideas, and it's it's just great to have discussions with him about this stuff. Um, and you can also nerd out about Ready Player One if you've, if you've read that out there.